Hi, I'm Eric Orner, and I'd like to read to you a couple of chapters of my upcoming graphic novel, Smart Guy, The Life and Times of LGBTQ Pioneer Barney Frank. It's 1967. Barney's a graduate student at Harvard, and he's earned a reputation in these early Vietnam War years as a talented political organizer. But now it's come time for him to write his thesis and he's struggling a little bit. Meanwhile, across the river in Boston, a very tough and contentious mayoral election is going on. It's an election that unbeknownst to Barney, he's about to play a big role in. Chapter five, Kevin versus Louise. Barney started to get invites to parties where he rubbed elbows with local media celebrities, activists, and politicians. Chris Lydon, meet Barney Frank. You two should get along famously. Both of you eat, sleep, and breathe politics. The talk was all about Vietnam, civil rights, poverty, summer homes. Same place I winter, Roxbury. Oh, right on. Barney was having these experiences in the fancy towns of Cambridge and its liberal neighbor, Brookline. Next door Boston, on the other hand, remained a bit of a mystery to him. It seemed to be a closed ecosystem, politically and socially. Sure, it was mostly as diverse as any other city, with Italians and Jews, Blacks and French Canadians, folks of Chinese ancestry, others from Portugal as well as its annual full-scale invasion of students from everywhere under the sun. It had Carl Yastrzemski hitting homer after homer at Fenway. It had world-class museums like the Isabella Stewart Gardner, a busy international airport, and the Pops. It had Bill Russell, amazing fans at Boston Garden, and a famously creaky mass transit system and hundreds of brilliant kids graduating each year from places like MIT and going on to tech pioneers like Wang Labs, Digital Computers, and Lotus. But despite all these attributes of a world-class city in Boston in the mid 1960s, if you were an Irish Catholic, if you or your dad or your grandpa hadn't been a sworn friend or blood enemy of the late mayor, James Michael Curley, hadn't taken part in the decades long Hibernian carnival that had been Curly's dominance over Boston? Well, friend, then you were nobody. And as the political bosses of the era used to say, we don't want nobody, nobody sent. Despite the ossified political landscape though, the physical one was changing fast. Older neighborhoods were bulldozed in the name of progress and urban renewal. Near the waterfront, block after block of tenements, dives, and mom and pop stores had been leveled to make way for a new government center. Now where will we get a drink? Or place our bets? Or see a girly show? Curse you, urban renewal, curse you. Out of the rubble arose a giant, and giantly ugly, pile that became Boston's new city hall. <gasps> Viva brutalism! Isn't it splendid? In 1967, a new mayor was to be elected. Business backed the guy who championed the government center project and promised more like it. Uh, uh, vote for me. Yeah, vote for him. Like civic improvement types since time memorial, however, this business candidate seemed to like humanity better than actual humans. The voters, in their wisdom, felt likewise. Nah, not feeling it. Us neither. Instead, defying the polls and the prognostications of the political experts and the condemnation of the Boston Globe and the hopes of the town's liberal elites, the September preliminary election resulted in a reactionary dam breach, otherwise known as Louise Day Hicks. A daughter of South Boston, the legendarily tough white working class neighborhood near the harbor. Louise married young, raised a family, 
and remarkably for a Southie matron of the 1950s, went to law school. Soon after graduating, she got elected to the Boston School Committee. Our Roxbury schools need textbooks. And plumbing. Order. Louise quickly became the committee's chairman and an unyielding voice of resistance to a changing city, especially to black citizens' demands for fair treatment in education. The lady cut a startling figure, a large woman with a baby doll face and a bouffant hairdo. She dog whistled or blowtorched her incendiary message and it resonated on street corners across the city. There is no segregation in Boston schools. White women can no longer walk the streets of Boston in safety. You know where I stand. Boston elects its mayors in a two-stage process. The top two vote getters in September's preliminary then face each other in the November final. On prelim night in 1967, voters in Southie, Dorchester, and Charlestown powered Louise, this prim voice of white backlash, this beauty parlor Godzilla, to a first place finish. With only six weeks to go before the final vote, Massachusetts liberals were shocked and dismayed. Mm, more Chablis? Better open another bottle. Placing second behind Mrs. Hicks was a political princeling named Kevin Hagen White, who'd followed a conventional path for the scion of an important Irish Catholic family. The son and grandson of local Democratic grandees and a graduate of Williams College, Kevin heard Perlay good looks and the family name into political office. He became the Massachusetts Secretary of State practically before the ink had dried on his BC law diploma. He was smart, if not particularly intellectual and suave, like a guy in an old spice ad. The kid could blow this thing to that broad if he don't get off his ass. Gramps says you'll lose to Louise if you don't get off your ass. Thanks, Pop. Heard him the first time. Just recharging my batteries here. And Kevin was charming when he wanted to be, which wasn't always. Kathy? Hey, Kath? He didn't love the political hustings like his old man. And he didn't mind the half-assed way that his brother was, quote unquote, managing the campaign, ensuring that Kevin had several nights off a week to spend at home with his smart and lovely wife, rather than being out pressing the flesh at some wake or fish fry. Are they gone? For the time being. Here's some flesh I don't mind pressing. <laughs> you should listen to them, you know. Do more nighttime events. Oh God, not you too. Kevin's attitude about campaigning was a problem because with only six weeks left before the election, Louise was picking up steam. Which is why, if elected, I will give 30% raises to our police officers and firefighters. All this greatly concerned the vault, a secretive club of the city's richest bankers and lawyers, whose members didn't like what the ladies' populism would mean for their business climate. So they held their noses and joined forces with Boston's liberals to back Kevin and inject some professionalism into his campaign. We are informed that there is currently a deficit of campaign professionals, and we use that word lightly, available to drop everything for the unenviable privilege of bringing order to the chaos of an attractive, if lazy, candidate's schedule, messaging, and as is the case with every politician this group has ever dealt with, Financing. Any thoughts, Professor? Hmm. As a matter of fact, I do. The professor was thinking of a young grad student named Barney Frank, who was sitting at that very moment across the river in crappy student housing, making not so much progress on his PhD thesis. <laughs> <laughs>